Alrighty, so let's see, is that, did that stop? There we go, okay. Um, so just in case I know a couple of you from previous classes, but if you don't know me, my name is Elizabeth Schwartz. Um, I'm your instructor for this quarter for Introduction to Ecology, and I'm super excited to be able to learn with everybody this summer. Um, I'm gonna introduce myself and my work a little bit more thoroughly in just a bit, but I wanted to say hi before we get started in earnest, and I also wanna point out our course's TA. His name is Ruby Harris Gavin. She's a complete rock star, um, and she'll introduce herself a little bit more later as well, but uh, Ruby, do you wanna just wave and say hi and introduce yourself? Yeah, hi everyone, I'm Ruby. Um, I think you might be on mute. Oh, wait, can you hear me? Could you hear me before? Okay, even my headphones weren't working. Um, thanks. Um, yeah, looking forward to getting to know all of you in section. And I think it's going to be a good quarter. I know things are hectic, but Elizabeth and I are working hard to make it not hectic and give you all some structure. So um, yeah, I think it's going to be good. I'll talk a little more later. Awesome. Thank you, Ruby. Um, before we get started, I'm sort of like, ecology content today, we're going to go over some more logistical and structural things. So the first and most important one, I think, is an acknowledgement of the current crises that we find ourselves in, both with the global pandemic and a global movement for social justice and against systemic racism. I want to acknowledge that these events are consuming a lot of our available bandwidth and energy, and we're all grappling with these crises that are bigger than all of us and trying to learn the basics of our chosen fields in the middle of all of it. So. Um, I just, it would be irresponsible of me not to acknowledge that these circumstances are occurring and to let you know that we're making a lot of changes to the syllabus to make this learning experience a lot more valuable for all of us in response. And I'm still learning how to do this and still making adjustments. That's why the syllabus is in this Google Doc so we can have it be sort of a, a living document and make, make adjustments as we go. Um, but one thing that I can say is that ecology is a major lens through which I'm able to, for the past 10 years, have been engaging with the world around me. Um, and I hope that I can demonstrate this quarter, the intersecting connections between ecology and public health and justice, in addition to the basics that we would normally learn in Introduction to Ecology. Um, and a big takeaway for the whole quarter should be that we can't and shouldn't remove humanity from the study of nature, no matter how hard the you know some of ecology's forefathers might have tried. So that's an outcome that I want to achieve for all of you. Um, ecology is an approach to understanding the natural world and humanity's role in it. Um, it's an approach that's been engaged with and has evolved in many different cultures around the world and throughout history, and it's far from a one-note field of study. So I, I really just wanted to, to make that clear that, you know, it can seem like just observing nature, but there's a lot of nuance to it, and I think um, we're going to get to all of that this quarter. Um, it's fast. It's six weeks. It's a lot to cover in six weeks, but I think we can do it. And again, we're going to be making adjustments as we go. And I'll be soliciting feedback from all of you all quarter, because I think that's going to be a big part of making this online learning experience a success. So definitely meta metaphorical doors are wide open to uh, communication. Feel free to email me at any time, private message me in the chat, um, raise your hand and speak in class. All of that is welcome. So uh, one thing that you um, can expect to see every day is an outline for what we're going to take away from each lecture, including today. Um, so today is going to be a lot of logistical stuff and going over the plan for the quarter, but we are going to dip our toes into some ecology-related stuff. Um, that being said, we're going to spend a lot of today getting feedback from you guys. So just to give you a heads up, I really would like, I have learning goals for what I hope is going to happen this quarter and what, what I hope we're going to get to, but I'd really love to get your feedback on what you're hoping to get out of this class. So the, another big takeaway for me, another big goal is I'd love for this class to add structure to everybody's lives, to everybody's educational journey this summer, but not additional stress. That is a completely unnecessary <laughs> addition to anybody's life right now. So um, again, I'm going to be welcoming your feedback to, to make sure that we're accomplishing that, that we're challenging everybody to, to reach the learning goals that we're going to crowdsource and put together as a class um, without being um, an additional source of stress. So let me just add one more person. Okay. Okay, so the three things that I think we're going to take away from today is we're going to do introductions to myself and to Ruby um, and the work that we do in the Young Lab at UCSB. 
Um, and we're also going to group source our uh, um, expectations for the quarter, uh, as well as some rules of engagement. I think that's an important thing to do when we're all interacting with each other online. It's just a totally different format than what we're used to. So uh, we're also gonna go over the syllabus. That's all kind of part and parcel with the, this is gonna be the structure and the expectations for the class. Um, and then if we have time, uh, and I hope we will, we're gonna buzz through some kind of like intro to the levels of ecological organization and start with kind of how we do ecology with a couple of examples. So yeah, in the meantime, I'm gonna start screen sharing and this is something I am still working on getting right. So give me just a second here. Oh, we got one person to add. Dang, we had a big meeting, this is great. Oops. A few people in the chat. Okay. All right. Has, is anybody having issues with the Zoom feed so far? All good? Cool. All right. Feel free to, um, clearly, I don't see the chats right away, but feel free to uh, just type something into the chat if you're having any issues. Elizabeth, I can keep track of the chat and let you know hey, if something. Really? Yeah. Perfect. That's great. Okay. All right, so we're gonna start sharing. Okay, let's see. Are you guys all seeing the slides? Okay, great, thank you. All right, so uh, obviously this is the EMB 120, it's Introduction to Ecology. Our lectures are gonna be Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday from 11 to 12.25. I am your instructor, I'm Elizabeth. Um, you can reach me at elizabethforbes at ucsb.edu. Ruby is the course TA. You can reach her at jrharrisgavin at ucsb.edu. Um, and the takeaways for today is, you know, in more general terms, or what are we gonna get out of this class? I really want that to be kind of the number one priority for today. Um, number two is gonna be going over ecological research and how it's done by ecologists. And number three is gonna be what are the levels of ecological organization. And this one seems a little bit specific, but the reason I bring it up is because um, that's gonna be kind of the framing for the entire course. A couple of you might've taken a look at the syllabus already, in which case you would have seen that there are, um, the way that it's currently set up is structured from individual to community and to biosphere. Um, that's sort of going up the chain of ecological organization and that's gonna be the structure of the course uh, and also the structure of your final project. And we'll talk about the final project in just a bit. So uh, as far as ecologists that you know, you know a lot of them at UCSB, we have a enormous ecology department, our ecology evolution and marine biology department. I'm just gonna quickly go over my work and uh, Ruby can talk about hers as well. Um, and we're both available to talk more about what we do at any time. So definitely feel free to reach out to us. Broadly, what I'm interested in is community ecology. So that's the um, study of groups of organisms, populations of organisms in an ecosystem interacting with each other. Um, defaunation is a term that means basically just the loss of or organisms from an ecosystem, whether that's just like fewer of them or wholesale extinction. Um, ecosystems ecology is another subfield of ecology where it's basically studying the transference of um, like nutrients and energy throughout the ecosystem. So stuff like nitrogen cycling, carbon cycling, all that, all that good stuff. Um, food webs is essentially exactly what it sounds like if you were to draw a line between every organism that eats another organism, um, what you would have is a food web. Uh, and there's some really cool ways that you can study those. Um, and then broadly, what I'm interested in for my own research is the impact of large wildlife on carbon cycling. So in terms of just introducing you to that, does anyone know what the Anthropocene is? If you do, you can type it into the chat or just say it out loud. And if you don't, that's okay, because it's a very weird term. Antibody. You might not have run across this term in your classes yet, but essentially what it means is the- uh, Wait, couple, couple chat oops. responses here. Oh, what do we got, Ruby? Um, Josh says, term to describe how humans have affected the environment. Yeah, and Hannah, mm -hmm. time period where humans impact climate. And Julia, yeah, yeah epoch defined by human effects 
on the earth. Totally. Yeah. That's, uh, that's a key word there is epoch. So the way that um, time periods, the way that like paleoecologists and archaeologists define epochs on the planet is, is these periods of time that are characterized by a given thing. So like an ice age, right? Um, the Anthropocene was argued about for a long time before people decided we were actually in it. Still up for debate, depending on who you're talking to. But essentially what it is, is it's defining um, a new epoch, probably starting sometime, depending on who you are, like the Industrial Revolution, and some people say like 1990, like just somewhere in that window of time, um, characterized by uh, disproportionate human impacts on the environment. So um, that's kind of the framing for under which a lot of the research in the Young Lab happens. So Anthropocene defunation is specifically defunation or the loss of organisms from ecosystems that is driven by human activity. So um, what this means in reality is globally we've seen massive declines in wildlife populations worldwide. We have 58% um, of vertebrate populations have experienced a decline in the abundance since about the 1970s. Invertebrates about 45%. Across all species, the decline is about 39%. This is huge. This is a massive amount of biodiversity. Um, and uh, if you think about their background extinction rates, so just like populations of organisms like blinking on and blinking off over long periods of time, that happens normally. That's a natural thing. But the rate of background or the rate of extinction that we're experiencing now in the Anthropocene is between 100 and 1,000 times the background extinction rate historically. So it is really apt to think about it as the Anthropocene defining characteristic. So what I'm really interested in is how does that impact the carbon cycle? So just really briefly, the carbon cycle is literally just how does carbon transfer from a gaseous form in the atmosphere where, it, where it's a greenhouse gas to a solid form where it's stored in plant tissue. I mean, we're all made of carbon where it's stored in, in solid forms or sequestered in the soil or the deep ocean and then broken down and, and emitted back into the atmosphere. I'm really, really interested in how large wildlife like these elephants and these other organisms um, impact that carbon cycle. So they have indirect effects on carbon cycling and that is what my research focuses on. And there's a couple of examples that I think are fun and also gross. Uh, <laughs> this is um, just ways that whales contribute to carbon cycling in the ocean. So they uh, mix water in the water column by swimming down to the bottom and feeding and then swimming back up top. So there's a lot of actual physical cycling that they're doing. But what they also do is they transfer carbon from the deep ocean where they feed to the surface where they just defecate and they provide tons of essential nutrients to algae blooms whose photosynthetic activity then pulls carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere into their own biomass. So without whales, you don't get that nutrient cycling and you don't get that algae bloom. This is also just like a ridiculous picture. I love it. It's so gross and awesome. <laughs> um, grizzly bears are another example that I um, Ruby has probably heard way too much about at this point, but uh, grizzly bears are another kind of conveyor belt for carbon. They, they feed on spawning salmon that are swimming up river, and then they transfer that carbon and nutrients by way of their feces, again, to forests, where the trees use them to grow larger and to sequester more carbon. Um, and you can actually see the trees that are in forests that have bears that perform this service are growing larger and sequestering more carbon than in forests that don't have these grizzly bear subsidies. And to give you one more example, um, this is, uh, you know, this is the hippopotamus, obviously, it's a group of hippopotamuses. They're bizarre creatures, they're amazing, they're wonderful. They uh, sleep in rivers all day and then they get out and they eat up to 100 pounds of plant material every night. So they're just like going around at night, mowing down all the vegetation, and then they retreat back to rivers during the day where they just sleep and poop. Um, and all of their feces wash down river. And again, support vibrant communities of plants and smaller organisms in the riparian zone. So those strips of super green ecosystems that, that sort of um, form alongside riverbanks. So in rivers that don't have hippos, in rivers where hippos have been exterminated for one reason or another, what you get is the slow dissolution of those riparian zones, right? So this is just a couple of big, literally big examples of large wildlife impacting the carbon cycle. And that's kind of the basis of, of my own research. So to understand the consequences of such biodiversity loss, ecologists, including myself, can use something called exclosure experiments. Um, literally what they are is fences. It just is areas where some wildlife can be um, compared to areas without fences uh, or with fences where wildlife are kept out. 
So uh, they're a hugely popular way to measure the effects of biodiversity loss, as you can see from this graph. Um, and they're located all over the world. It doesn't include all kinds of exposures. These are, this is a map of just exposure experiments for native wildlife. Um, and those that are bigger than, you know, like little tiny five by five meter ones. Um, so there's a lot of exposures that we're not seeing, but they are the, you know, the point you're made is that they're a very popular experimental device. And I work in an exposure experiment in central Kenya in like Kipiak County for my research um, at Impala Research Center, which is located right where that red star is. And it's called the like, Kenya Long-Term Exposure Experiment or the CLE. And essentially it was set up to examine the impacts of large bodied wildlife species and domestic herbivores like cattle on the ecosystem. In this case, a savanna, it's a mixed use savanna um, used for both um, domestic cattle grazing and obviously for, for wildlife use. And it's been running for about 25 years. And during that time, ecologists have observed some pretty incredible shifts in ecological setup and functioning, depending on what herbivores are allowed in each plot. So here you can see this is um, a, a plot where all wildlife plus domestic cattle are allowed to graze. Here is where you just have large wildlife and cattle are kept out. Here's where you purposefully exclude the large wildlife that are native. And here is where you take out everything. It's just anything smaller than like a rabbit is allowed in and nothing larger. So um, for example, when there's no larger herbivores of any kind in this big X out plot right here, what you see is twice the population density of rodents, which are smaller herbivores. Um, and this is because uh, they're released from competition from larger herbivores. There's a lot more vegetation for them to snack on. Um, and as a result of the fact that you have twice as many rodents, you see twice as many snakes because there's twice as many rodents for them to munch on, right? And then you see a ton more ticks and fleas and other ectoparasites that could carry zoonotic diseases like tick bite fever. Um, and there's really similar experiments in uh, the Northeast that are looking at the impacts of wildlife loss on things like Lyme disease. So that is me measuring carbon cycling in the clay pots. Um, I have a temperature and moisture sensor on my head because it seemed like the most logical place to put it. So that is what that is in case you're wondering. Um, but yeah, uh, I also do a lot of um, collaboration with uh, other scientists kind of across the scientific spectrum to do my work. Um, so this project, I collaborated with uh, a computer scientist and an engineer and a geographer to measure carbon flux, which is basically just the emissions of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And we made these cool little robots. They're super fun. Um, I also do quite a lot of lab work, which, you know, I, I tolerate. I prefer field work, but uh, I do a lot of lab work where I take soil and I incubate it in jars and I measure the rate of carbon dioxide emissions from those soils. Um, so in essence, this is what I do. It's like the messiest Venn diagram of all time, which is sort of, I'm realizing, the hallmark of doing any kind of research. You just keep on collaborating with people and keep on bringing in new tools and, um, and methods. So, you know, for me, I, I really, I think I fall in this sweet spot between community ecology and ecosystems ecology. And these purple circles are the tools that I use. Um, you know, some that are way outside my comfort zone, like robotics, but others that are a little bit more in line with what you know, you might think of when you think of an ecologist, like an exposure experiment. So, so that's me, and this is Ruby. So, Ruby, if you want to introduce yourself briefly, that would be awesome. Yes. Um, okay. Is this working now? Can everyone hear me through this yeah, mic? Me. Okay. Great. Um, I don't have any slides because my research changed very quickly. A um, little bit about me and what I was studying until COVID. Um, I actually went to UCSB as an undergraduate and I studied zoology and biological anthropology. So for anyone out there that doesn't quite know what they want to do, I've definitely tried it all before I got to ecology. Um, and I'm happy to talk about that in section. But my research when I first got to UCSB um, in Hillary Young's lab was at Tejon Ranch here in California, similar to what Elizabeth studies, big exclosure plots, keeping out cattle and elk and deer. And I was looking at the diet differences between cattle and elk up there. Um, I was really interested in how they might interact and how they might impact um, and change native and versus non-native species, plant species up there. And so I was curious to see what exactly they were eating. But of course, my research was about to all go into the lab. Um, I collected these fecal samples 
basically just poop. You go out there and you collect poop and you can get the plant DNA from these samples, which is pretty incredible, but that's something that it can do. I was about to start lab work and uh, yeah, COVID shut down all the labs. So that is no more. So my new research project as of two months ago is a meta-analysis looking at all of these exposure plots all around the world and comparing them to this awesome database that has a lot of plant, the plant side of these uh, exposure plots basically. And so I'm interested in seeing how large herbivores, either present or absent, can impact plant species on a really, really broad scale um, and less looking at just one specific site. And so what I'm interested in really particularly is how, what you might call the selectivity of an herbivore. So like how picky an herbivore might be. Like some are what they might call generalists. Like if you think of goats, right? Goats eat just about everything. Whereas something else might be really particular and want to eat just one type of grass. So I'm curious to see how those types of herbivores and their differences might change how plant communities, you know, grow and how their uh, dominance might shift. You know, the dominant trait, I mean, the dominant plant uh, in a plant community is just the one that there's the most abundance of. And let's say that's the one that herbivores want to eat. You know, the plant community is going to change. And all of this I'm very interested in from an anthropology point of view. At the end of the day, I'm very interested in people and sort of what Elizabeth was touching at at the beginning. People are part of the environment. And I, I feel that very strongly. And I think that they should be factored into the science that we do. So I'm particularly interested in domestic animals um, like cattle and sheep and deer and how those herbivores are replacing wild ones. And if there's some way that um, all of these herbivores can coexist maybe in some way. And, um, but yeah, I'm a first year master's student. So just starting out here at UCSB. And I guess that's a little bit about me. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about myself in section, of course, too, um, which I'm very, very excited for. I think it's going to be good. I think that's a little bit about me, Elizabeth. I might throw it back to you unless there's something else I forgot. But I don't think. No, that's great. Um, we did have a great question in the chat, which was, um, why is landscape mapping not used for ecosystems? It seems like ecosystems involve more inorganic factors than community. This is a really fantastic question and one that I think we're going to drill down on at several different points in the quarter. Um, essentially, uh, my, my short answer right now before we get into more, you know, because we're going to touch on that at every stage of ecological organization, but what you'll see hopefully is that um, most ecological processes are controlled by both biotic, so living and abiotic, non-living factors. So you have pressures from biotic, you know, biotic influences like soil microbes or what's eating what, you know, do you have this herbivore pooping all over this place? Do you have this herbivore pooping all over this place? Like, you know, that sounds, that's a kind of a crude way to, to talk about it, but it's true. I mean, those are things that control the abiotic factors in an ecosystem as well. And the abiotic factors in an ecosystem, for instance, like what's the bedrock, what's the parent material of an ecosystem, how did that soil form, what's the soil type, what kinds of like ions are available for different microorganisms in the soil, these are all things that are extremely important too, so you'll see that they're super, super interconnected. Um, but that's a great question. Uh, the other stuff I wanted to talk about, okay, so now that we have um, intros kind of done and dusted, um, I wanted to let you know that I will be sending you after class today a survey. Um, it's just going to be like the only take home assignment that you guys have for this week. Um, and it would be great if you can send it back as soon as you can. The results will be anonymous, so I might refer to like broad trends in the results if it's helpful. Like most folks are worried about how grading is going to work. And so we're going to spend five minutes talking about that. Um, basically, what it is, it's just kind of a taking the temperature of the class sort of survey. I wrote it like way before instruction went online back at the beginning of winter quarter in preparation for this class. So some of it feels maybe perhaps a little outdated, but it will help me sort of figure out how best to tailor instruction to this group of students, um, especially in these circumstances online. So um, keep your eyes peeled for that survey in your inboxes after class. Um, and I'm gonna get back to sharing slides with you guys. And we're gonna do a couple activities really quickly. Everybody see that? Great. 
Okay. So um, again, going over lecture today, we're going to go over course mechanics, uh, goals, syllabus grading. We're going to talk about what colleges do, um, what kinds of questions they ask, what kinds of approaches they use to answer those questions, and we're going to talk about how the environment impacts uh, ecology and why that's important. So big thing is what do you want to get out of this course and why are you taking it? I expect that you'll talk about this in section as well, um, but what I would love is um, if everybody could uh, we have um, a collective goals Google Doc that I'm going to fill out uh, as we chat. Um, and what I would like is if everybody, I'm going to split you out into breakout rooms of about like six or so. And if you guys could just kind of like share um, your interest in taking this class, it could be literally as simple as like, I need this major requirement to graduate, or it could be I'm interested in a career in research. Um, and then talk about sort of what you're hoping to get out of this class and then we'll come back together and if one person from every group could kind of report back, I'll write that down in our Google Sheet and post it on the Goucher space and we can make sure that we try to tackle those as well. So, um, see. Um, I'm gonna have, let's see, about, all right. Um, can everybody see this Google Doc? Someone wants to give me a verbal, verbal yes? Yes. Yes. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Okay, cool. So um, if anybody can start, so you can, if anybody has any um, big learning goals that they want to add to the list, feel free to just either chat it into the our chat box or um, say it out loud. Ruby had a really good one, which was um, exposure to uh, the different kinds of research happening at UCSB, which I thought was a really good one. Okay, a couple of responses in the chat. Um, Rishi's group was interested in the relation between ecology and public health. Mm -hmm. um That's yes great. courtney we'll probably um, talk about that quite a bit towards uh in the last like two weeks or so i think it's a good spot for that cool yeah another group also interested in ecosystems and public health great cool anybody else there were 12 groups so i know for sure, we've got more than two. <laughs> okay, Eric says, yeah, the course description is interesting. Um, some people are there just to fill, fulfill the requirement, of course, it's one of the classes. Um, yeah, and focusing on research, learning about the research is cool. Um, let's see, getting, the, getting better at ecological principles, right? Getting those foundations, definitely. Um, one group is interested in the actual profession of a field researcher and what they get to do in the field. So getting that. Awesome. Um, so one thing that'll be great uh, this coming Friday, the last 30 minutes of class, we're going to be talking with Dr. Rita Mehta, who's a, an ecologist at UC Santa Cruz. Um, she's an animal behavioral ecologist, excuse me. So you guys can ask her all sorts of questions about how she got to where she's at. And, and the kind of work that she does. She's insanely cool. Hopefully we'll do more um, guest lectures like that too. Um, let's see, a uh, group interested in learning uh, the role ecology plays in conservation science specifically. Um, yeah, generally learning about things that you know, we, that we don't know yet, but people want to know. Um, I'm going to phrase that as learning how to ask ecological questions. Yeah. Because there's so many. It feels like the, the, like the deeper I get into my dissertation, the research, the more I'm like, oh my God, so many more things that I yeah. will not have time to do. <laughs> but I hope someone takes the mantle of. And it looks like we might have an MCDB person or two. Sweet. I don't think it's required for MCDB, but um, just a good, you know, intro to other science, I think. 
Um, right. And yeah, getting exposed to research at UCSB as well, as we've said. Right. Already too. Awesome. Well, let's see. Um, let's, that feels like a really good round, like tangible, bite sizable set of goals that we can add to the syllabus. And I'm going to try to incorporate these goals into different parts of the syllabus. Again, if you feel like um, there's something that you want to learn more about or to do uh, to do more with, please reach out, let me know. We can definitely make adjustments as we go. That's what I'm hoping to make this quarter as flexible as possible while still really hammering down on those, those principles, those fundamentals, um, but contextualizing them in stuff that you guys are interested in. And Elizabeth, um, there was sweet. just one more. Um, great. It's, well, it's mm. not too yeah. long the list. Um, yeah, the different ways that ecology can be a major theme for all types of careers. So yes. a great one. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Okay, this is like, um, if any of you have been in any classes that I've teed for before, you'll know that I feel very passionately about this. There are like endless ways to be an ecologist and endless ways to be an environmental scientist and not all of them involve like becoming a professor at a university. That is a very, very narrow um, view of, uh, of what is possible within the field of, of ecology as, as a career path. And so I would love to talk about that with any or all of you. Um, and hopefully we'll, we'll expose you guys to a couple of different ideas of what those careers can be. So that's a really, really great question. Okay, so the different ways that ecology can be a major theme in a variety of careers. Okay, sweet. Okay, that's awesome. Um, alrighty, thank you guys for doing that. That is exactly what I was hoping to get out of this. Um, I'm gonna go back to screen share mode for you today. Okay. See, can everybody see that? Great. Okay. All right. So here's what I want us to get out of the class by the end, and I'm going to add our crowdsourced uh, list of stuff to this, um, and add that to add that list onto our Gaucho space. Um, it looks like a lot, but most of the stuff we're going to try to tackle together because um, the goals are complementary to each other. So we're going to do a pretty rigorous and quantitative understanding of the basic concepts in ecology. One thing that I'd really like to make clear is that you can use um, what we talk about as theoretical ecology, but really just means like math heavy ecology. Um, and math can be a really, really amazing tool for understanding the ecosystems around you and ecosystems you've never been to and all kinds of amazing stuff. And I think it's something that I personally, I was an art major before I became an ecology major in college. And so the transition um, into uh, a lot of math felt really daunting to me at first. Um, I think it's something that can be really beautiful and really helpful. And so I hope that we um, can walk through all of that together in a way that um, makes sense and also emphasizes what a useful tool it can be for even you know field ecology, which feels like it shouldn't necessarily involve math. <laughs> um, but it can, and it does, and it's great. Uh, I also want us to understand and appreciate how ecological research is done with some tools to go further, critical thinking about primary research. Um, I want you guys to get excited about the importance of ecology for understanding and adapting to the changing world around us. I think um, that's something that's been in the news for all of our lives is how much the world is changing. And I think that that's um, ecology, again, can be a really beautiful web through which to view those changes and to contextualize them and to understand them. And again, exposure to research going on at UCSB that I'd love to get some of the many researchers, the amazing researchers here um, to help some of our learning goals, um, whether we're reading their papers or hearing them talk to us directly. Um, another thing that I want us to do is rules of engagement. Um, I don't know if this is gonna work. <laughs> Hang on, I'm gonna back out of sharing here. So I'm gonna be, I'm gonna, this is the least number of breakout rooms I will subject you to all quarter, I promise. Um, but hang on, for some reason I'm not able to unshare. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna break you out into breakout rooms just for another five minutes really quickly because I wanna use the last 20 or 25 or 30 minutes to talk ecology stuff. But I think it's really important that we talk about, um, uh, oh, the doc does not exist. It will exist in a moment, we'll get there. Uh, but uh, yeah, oh. rules of engagement by that, I mean, how do we 
talk about the topics that we're going to be discussing in class, what kinds of um, kind of rules do we want to set for ourselves as an online learning community, and what kind of guidelines do we want to set for ourselves. Um, so that should just be five minutes in your breakout room, same, same deal as before, and then we will record that and put it in another Google Doc, which will also live on our Goucher space. So I'm going to set that up. Okay. Alrighty, so you can join your breakout rooms. And um, yeah, again, reminder, just rules of engagement means sort of exactly what I said. How are we going to engage with each other as we as we are learning this quarter? Here we go class, uh, but I think given uh, online learning, I really want to make sure that this is something that's going to work for everybody um, and make sure everybody reaches the learning goals that we're setting out for ourselves. Um, so I appreciate your, your hanging in for the slightly longer than usual syllabus part of syllabus day. Um, okay, so I am going to go ahead and share um, again the rules of engagement doc, um, which I probably should say that um, rules is probably a slightly more um, uh, a slightly more particular word than is necessary. Our group kind of came up with guidelines that we should hope to follow and stuff that worked last quarter or didn't work last quarter. Um, so does anybody have anything to add to this list? Um, this is the stuff that, that my group put together. You're also welcome to put them into the chat. Um, Elizabeth, my group talked about um, basically when you are talking in Zoom, you know, to it's it's very easy to, for people to awkwardly be interrupted, but you know, things just happen more slowly in Zoom, and so let people finish their thoughts and respond respectfully, and you know, then take your turn. It's definitely more of a turn-taking uh, type of discussion than in person in person interaction, but. Yeah, remembering that patience is key with Zoom and letting people finish their thoughts. Yeah, that's a really good one. And I really, I'm a talker, as you will discover throughout this quarter. Um, so sometimes that's not a rule. I, that's a rule I have to remind myself to abide by. So I appreciate that one. Anything else? This is also, again, going to be a living document on our Gaucho space. So if there's something that comes up or something that you think is important that gets added to this, um, please get in touch and let me know and I can add to it. Um, by participating in this class, we're all agreeing to abide by these rules of engagement or to at least, um, if it's not a rule per se, to acknowledge that the situation is different and we're going to be making adaptations as necessary. So, alrighty. Cool. Thank you guys for doing that. I promise no more breakout rooms for today. Um, okay, so we are going to go back to the PowerPoint, though, and we're going to spend the last 25 minutes of class kind of getting as far as we can. We're going to go through the syllabus. We're going to go through the required materials um, and uh, briefly, um, uh, briefly uh, talk about sort of um, some, some broad concepts in ecology. So, okay, let's see. I will get more adept at the sharing screen thing. Okay, is everybody seeing this? Awesome, thank you, okay. Um, so the way that we've split up the syllabus is very intentional and it's um, in the order of the um, order of ecological organization, right? And we'll talk about that in just a second. We're going to spend the first third of the quarter talking about individual organisms and the populations of like organisms that they live in. Um, and then we're going to switch to in green the communities that multiple populations in an ecosystem form. And then finally, we're going to talk about whole ecosystem dynamics and the concepts 
that address conserving them, stuff like climate change, ecosystems, ecology, that's when it'll get folded in there. And that's when we can talk about stuff um, as well, in addition to probably in various places um, in the yellow and green sections, stuff like uh, public health and the intersection of conservation of public health. So um, this text is Bowman, Hacker, and Kane. It's entitled Ecology. Um, it's, a very, it's a very great basic ecology textbook. Um, it's a pretty rigorous primer on the field of ecology. ecology in general. It's got a ton of really great examples. This is optional reading. If you would like to purchase this textbook from the bookstore, they have it on reserve. Um, and I can, I'll can i send information on the text out to you guys um, after class along with the survey. Um, it is not essential. I am going to be teaching from this and several other sources. So the material in this textbook that you will be, for example, assessed on um, is going to be in our lecture. But if you would like this textbook to go along with, um, with the lectures, uh, this is the one. It's the fifth edition, Ecology by William Bowman and Sally Hacker. Another optional text uh, is Gatelli, A Primer of Ecology. This is a much more theoretical ecology um, sort of text. So again, it's super mathy. It goes through all of the theory behind things like population growth. Um, and we're going to be, um, I'm also going to be teaching from this textbook quite a bit as well. So you don't necessarily need either of these textbooks. These are going to be optional, additional, if you would like to get deeper into any of these topics on your own, these are the two texts we'll be using. Um, what you will be required to read, as you already know from this week, are a couple of primary research articles every week. Um, next week, I think you have a primary research article and sort of a more pop side type article for the week after. Um, so it's going to be a combination, mostly primary research articles, also some more stuff like, you know, the New York Times coverage of a recent study or something like that. Um, and as far as the required reading goes, it should be set one week out. So right now the syllabus online is a little bit outdated from week three on in terms of the primary literature that you're assigned. So um, just keep your eyes peeled on the syllabus. I will never update it without letting you know um, less than a week in advance. Um, and we're also going to have uh, podcasts and pop sci articles to consume this quarter. There's so much good science content out there and a lot of it's ecology related. Another thing that I'm going to add to the Gaucho space is just like a totally optional list of cool science and ecology themed content. So books, podcasts, um, really cool episodes of like Planet Earth or whatever, um, stuff that I find really helpful and awesome. So, um, okay, that was a lot of syllabus -y and structural type stuff. Um, so if anyone has any questions um, before we dive into some ecology stuff for the last 20 minutes or so, now would be a good time. Um, I have a question about the yeah. extra credit assignment. Yeah, Can it absolutely. be like human to human interactions like in the real world or does it have to be like animal? I think um, I'm gonna, that would be one restriction I would probably make is that I think interhuman interactions uh, would not be something that would be, would count for the extra credit product. If you have a human and other species interaction, that's probably okay as long as all five of your interactions are not like, I saw a person pet their dog kind of thing. Um, mostly because uh, those are pretty anthropocentric oriented interactions, which doesn't mean they're not important and you can definitely include them, but make sure that you have a, a good variety. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you so much. Great. Um, and another thing on the syllabus, which uh, Ruby will talk about in section as well, is that you will be assessed on uh, reading those primary research articles in section. Um, however, it's also going to be an online quiz on Gaucho Space that will be open until the following Wednesday. Um, and you will be assessed on the reading of the papers from the previous week. So for instance, by 9 a.m. next Wednesday, you should have done the reading assessment uh, on this week's article. Okay. Then, Elizabeth, in the yeah. chat, there's a, a question similar to what you just answered, but will we be tested on the material that is re required reading? So just to clarify, yes. so yes, yeah. in section, yeah. that's part of what section participation and discussion will be about are these uh, reading quizzes, but I don't think on the actual, well, actually, Elizabeth, I'll turn it to you, on the actual e midterm exam, will there be reading material? Yeah, so there will be some, uh, some so the midterm exam is going to be a take-home exam, um, and you'll have two and a half-ish days to complete that. It should take about the, the length of one class period, so if you do want to take it during the 90-minute period um, on the Wednesday that the midterm is going to be, that's great. If you want to take it between that class period and the end of the day Friday, 
um, that's also fine. So that's how much time you'll have to complete it. It will include questions on the required readings from the previous week. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about, we're still working out how to do asynchronous um, section participation, but rest assured that if you do need to be asynchronous for the sections, there will still be ways for you to um, discuss the papers of Ruby and your coffee. Cool. Anybody else? Great. Um, okay, so let me just check the time. All right, sweet. So we're going to buzz through some stuff for like real quick. Um, so we're going to talk about what is ecology. It's an approach to understanding the natural world. Um, it's certainly not the only approach to understanding the natural world. Um, and as a field of study, it typically deals with processes at the level of the individual organism and above. So what do I mean by level? Um, Basically, uh, I've, I've referred to the levels of ecological organization quite a lot by now. It is the framing on which the, the syllabus is built, and it is the framing on which your final assignment will be built. Um, basically, uh, what they are is starting at the organism level, starting at the individual level, looking at the survival and reproduction of an organism. An organism is the unit of natural selection. Natural selection acts on an organismal level. Um, going one step above that is a population. You're looking at population dynamics like growth or extinction. Um, it's the unit of evolution. Above that is communities, so it's interactions between populations of different species living in the same environment. If you zoom back up to the ecosystem, what you're looking at, you're, you're incorporating all those abiotic factors then. You're looking at the flux of energy, the cycling of nutrients, and how all of those things knit together. And then at the biosphere level, you have global processes like climate, you have stuff like how, you know, different wind cells over different parts of the planet, you know, contribute to things like deserts being over here and forests being over here, right? So, so we go from the organism all the way up to the biosphere and all these things are inextricably linked to each other. So the way that we study ecology, we start often, but not always with uh, observation. So basically an observation just documents the pattern to be studied, forms the basis of the question to be asked, and being a good natural historian helps. I am a terrible natural historian. I still somehow manage to be an ecologist, so it's not a prerequisite. But it does mean that if you are familiar with the environment around you, you can observe when something interesting, novel, weird is happening in the natural world. And then uh, the next step often is experimental. It uses manipulation to isolate the question that you're in. So, so usually the question comes from an observation, um, and then you use experimental manipulation to isolate the question of interest. Um, generally speaking, it involves hypothesis testing. So if you have a question, what do you think is going to happen? What, is, what do you think is the explanation for that question? What do you think is the, is the answer? Um, you develop a hypothesis. I think this is the answer because of X reason. And then you develop an experiment around that hypothesis to test it explicitly. And then theoretical is sort of the third pillar of a studying ecology. It uses models, usually mathematical models. Um, or results from previous uh, experimental and observational studies plugged into those models to, um, to really uh, give much more depth to the answers to those questions or to be able to project out into the future new and different circumstances, um, that kind of thing. So they're used together in an iterative process as well. So uh, we're gonna go over an example for that iterative process um, and it's gonna get a little bit we might skip over parts of it because it's uh, a very detailed example of the intersection of observation, experiment, and theory, um, but it's kind of a cool one. So um, ecology, again, study of interactions between an organism, which is an individual or population, and its biotic, which, again, the living parts of its environment, other organisms, from plants to other animals, um, and animals here include things like microbes in the soil or parasites or whatever. Um, and abiotic, so the non-living parts of the environment like geography or weather patterns, that kind of thing. So here we have two snowshoe hares. Um, it could be the same snowshoe hare actually because one is, uh, has white fur and the other has brown and gray sort of mottled fur. And as you can see, they blend into their environment. So they're abiotic, they're non-living environment. So the white furred snowshoe hare blends into the snow behind it and the mottled one blends into the similarly mottled rocks and soil behind it. So the kinds of questions we can ask here is why, why does this same snowshoe hare have different colored fur uh, in the winter versus the spring? 
And so we can look at the difference between the ultimate and the proximate causes of something that we observe in nature. So uh, we want to know what, it was, what is the ultimate cause? Why on earth is this happening? And what is the proximate cause? What is the mechanism by which it's occurring? So we want to know, our question is, why do snowshoe hairs fur change color in different seasons? Um, and the ultimate cause here is uh, basically anything involving how an organism looks phenotypically is kind of the why. Why does that change occur? Um, ultimately, why does an animal's fur, why does a snowshoe hair's fur change color seasonally? Um, and here the ultimate cause is genetic variation within a population of hairs. And that kind of leads to the genetic ability to change fur color in response to seasonality. So the ultimate cause of this change in fur color is, however, predicated or, or driven by a more immediate or approximate cause. So ultimate versus proximate causes. We have the ultimate why, and we have the proximate sort of how, if that makes sense. So the proximate cause here is predation. So uh, it's a pressure that's immediately responsible for a given outcome. So if a snowshoe hare can be seen more easily by one of its predators, like a lynx, because its fur doesn't give it any camouflage, it is much more likely to be eaten. So if you see this guy over here, uh, he's a goner. He's a total goner because it's so obvious to see him against the backdrop. Here, this, this white fur snowshoe hare is blending into the snow, and here, this model fur snowshoe hare is blending into the rocks behind it. So uh, overall, this predation pressure results in a population of snowshoe hares that are more genetically likely to be able to change their fur color to white in the winter time and that brown gray mottled color when the snow melts. So um, this is just a graph demonstrating kind of the timeline of that. Um, one of the ways that genetic predisposition in this population of snowshoe hares works is um, the amount of daylight. So it's an interaction between the organism, in this case, the snowshoe hare and its environment, in this case, the length of the day. Um, so the shorter days of winter trigger the fur change to white, and the longer days of spring trigger that change to brown. So this guy here is kind of in the middle of a transition. So um, an interesting thing to think about there, kind of an offshoot of the question we're on right now, is how are things like human disturbance going to impact that photoperiodism or that ability of a snowshoe hair to adapt its fur color to the length of the day. Um, one thing that is interesting to think about and has been in the news quite a lot lately, I don't know if anyone saw those headlines about the Arctic being over 100 degrees Fahrenheit this past week. What that might mean is that we're getting few snow covered days in the winter time. So these snowshoe hairs are still using the length of the day as a cue to change their fur color, but there's actually not as much snow on the ground or less or fewer days with snow cover. So what they're doing is actually turning into an evolutionary trap where something that was really, really beneficial to them in the past in avoiding predation is with the advent of changing temperatures because of climate change impacting their ability to survive, right? So that's just kind of an interesting offshoot of a question there. Um, so uh, yeah, that's the same, same graph. <laughs> this is just looking at, uh, the sort of shifting uh, color mismatch, that window of time where there's snow on the ground versus uh, the color of fur of the snowshoe hairs. So um, this is because, uh, and, and sort of the driver, the reason that this proximate cause of predation is the driver of that ultimate change in fur color is that 95% um, of snowshoe hair mortality is because of predation. You never have a snowshoe hair that just like dies of old age. <laughs> it almost always just gets eaten. Um, so this graph here shows the color contrast between uh, a hair. So we have 0% color contrast. It's perfectly blended in with this environment and 100% color contrast. So it's just slowly standing out and it's percentage or it's uh, likelihood of weekly survival. So we have almost complete likelihood of survival when it's a 0% color contrast, which goes down pretty precipitously as the color contrast goes up. So what's more is that these pressures on populations of individuals can scale up to impact the community that the population is a part of. So here, what you see, some of you might have seen this graph before. It's a pretty classic ecology example. Um, it's a, a graph of the linked hair population dependency that um, it's 
uh, basically what it's saying is, so this is a graph of over 75 years made from data collected by the Hudson Bay Company, which was a fur trapping company in the Hudson Bay in the Northeast, um, in the Northeast of the US and the Southeast of Canada. Um, and they specialized in the use of furs to make things like hats. Um, and that meant that they had, shockingly, this is a weird byproduct of their, of their profession, really, really amazing density data on all different kinds of animals that they made hats from, <laughs> including hares and lynx. Lynx is their primary predator. So they have this really cool um, 75 years worth of data on these um, cycles, the cyclical pattern of hares in red and lynx in blue. And what you can see is that those two populations are totally dependent on each other. When the snowshoe hare population drops, the lynx, hare, the lynx population is gonna drop shortly after, right? Because its main source of food, the population has gone down. So it can't sustain a population this large anymore. And that will just keep happening over generations. Um, it's not the only thing going on. So lynx and hare populations exist within larger communities. They're not just two populations interacting with each other and nothing else going on. Um, there's other drivers of population size for both species, including things like parasitism. Um, so in years of high nematode infections, you can expect to see relatively lower survival shift, right? So in these years right here, you could expect perhaps that the hare population is experiencing higher levels of parasitism than in these past years over here. And you can say that, okay, well, if the hair population is lower because of parasitism, then we're gonna see a decline in the population of lynx as well. So this is what ecology is. It's the study of interactions between an organism and its biological and physical environment. We've got, we've got ultimate and proximate causes of fur change color in the snowshoe hairs. We've got um, that population cycling, uh, having significant impacts on the population cycling of its main predator and also it's impacted by the likelihood of parasitism or the, or the parasite load that the population is experiencing. So um, how can we use the study of ecology to better understand these many interactions? We can focus on observation of nature. We can do things like look at the 75 year um, tracking of these populations by the Hudson Bay Company. Um, we can see how the populations of snowshoe hares and lynx track each other over time, how a warming climate might have contributed to a drop in the snowshoe hare population because of that mismatch between its fur color and the amount of snow in the ground, um, and how the lynx population followed suit because of overhunting. Um, we can also move out to a landscape scale. So this is looking at lynx predator dynamics across all of Canada um, and observe population dynamics at all of these different sites. So that's something that an ecologist who has a huge research program at a place like UCSB or the University of British Columbia might set up different experiments all across Canada to look at population dynamics and see if they're the same across maybe a climate gradient, across um, different population densities of hares, all kinds of different experimental variables. So to augment our observations, we can use theory to better understand those dynamics. And again, when I say theory, I usually mean mathematical models of populations and their interactions. So um, we're not gonna step through this because we're gonna talk about lack of both terra models later, but essentially what it is is it's a classic um, mathematical model to describe that wave function that a population experiences over time. And um, it's just a cool thing. <laughs> it's a really cool um, mathematical model that has been uh, used pretty heavily for the past 50 years or so to describe different populations over time. Um, and essentially what that does is it says, okay, you have this population, it's this size, and it is experiencing cycling because of resource limitations. So it grows to a certain size and then it doesn't have enough resources to grow anymore, so it shrinks back down and then it goes back up and down and back up and down. And here's the predator. So here we're gonna, we're gonna add that into the equation and we're gonna say, okay, this is the population density of its main predator. And that's gonna be inextricably linked to the population density of its prey. Um, and then the third thing we can do is experiment. So let me just check the time. All right, we have four minutes, so this is gonna go fast. <laughs> um, the first step, okay, so we have a question here. Our, hypothesis, our question is, are linked hair population cycles, are they lockable terra? cycles. So do they depend on each other? Does this cycle depend on this cycle, right? And so our hypothesis, our first one is that the cycles are driven by lockable terra predator-prey dynamics as predicted by that predator-prey model. 
Our second hypothesis is that cycles are driven by large scale climate fluctuations, including um, those fluctuations that impact the food of snowshoe hares. And our third hypothesis is that cycles are driven by hare population crashes from disease, stress, or lack of food at high density, so resource limitation. Um, and so we can run an experiment on all this. We can, we can test the relative importance of things like predators, food, lack of resources in a very explicit experimental setup. So I won't go through this experiment, but someone did this very experiment. Um, Charles Krebs, who's a professor at the University of British Columbia in the Department of Zoology, um, he put big one kilometer square plots in a boreal forest where these two species lived. And he did things like add fertilizer. Um, he reduced the predators with fencing. He added food and he reduced the predators and added food at the same time. And what he saw is that the increase in population, you know, you did see twice as many snowshoe hares without predators. And you saw two thirds is, or 150%, uh, what am I saying, 250%. You saw 1.5, what am I doing? This is, <laughs> I'm getting the math wrong. But you saw basically a stepwise increase in the population density of snowshoe hares uh, when you reduce predators. And then when you still have predators, but you give them extra food. Okay, so what we're saying here is that the uh, influence of food is actually stronger than removing predators. But when you remove predators and add food, you get this like massive increase, this huge jump in the population density of snowshoe hares, which um, basically tells us that the interaction between the addition of food and the removal of pred predators resulted in a much larger population boom than either of the two changes alone because of both higher survival rates, because they weren't being preyed upon, and higher reproduction rates because the hares had more food. So you're reducing two different pressures at once, such that the interaction between the two is actually greater than the sum of its parts. If it didn't have that interaction, you would just expect this maybe to be this plus this, right? But instead it's much larger. So basically the, the conclusion there is that like, yes, lack of Volterra makes sense here, but it's actually a lot more complicated than that. Um, so that's cool because we can put all three kinds of science together. We can put observation, we can put experimentation, and we can put theory together to examine a question of sort of why do we see these cyclical patterns in population density for both snowshoe hares and their predators. Um, so yeah, so that's a cool thing. Um, the conclusion there is that nature is insanely complicated and that any time that you dig into any part of it, uh, you reveal more questions than um, than you think might actually have been there in the first place, which I think is, a, is an experience that all of us have had with science and certainly myself. Um, so with that, we have one minute left. Um, we'll get to biosphere and ecosystems level stuff uh, tomorrow. We'll, we'll just finish that up quickly. Um, does anyone have any questions on what we just went over? This was just basically supposed to be like, this is how we do science, this is how we do ecology. Um, and we look at it at all of these different levels of ecological organization. If anybody doesn't have any questions, that's totally okay too. Um, and also, uh, this lecture will be posted in Gaucho Space as soon as I can get it up there. So you're welcome, obviously, to go back and look at any of it. Um, we probably will be touching base with the snowshoe hairs and the lynx again this quarter. So don't worry, we're going to come back to it. Um, but tomorrow we will start with a review of the abiotic environment, so stuff like climate, and then we will get into physiological ecology, so the study of individual organisms and how they operate. Cool. Thank you guys very much for spending so much time on the structure of this course, and we're going to get way more into the science stuff tomorrow. Cool. I think that is it. Uh, thank you. Thank you guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, cool. Um, so there's a link in the chat for an analytical solution to the Laca Volterra model, which is very awesome. So I saw that. Thank it was you. pretty cool. Yeah, thanks for posting that. And to Audrey asked if I can make the lecture slides printer ink friendly. I will definitely try to do that. I hadn't even thought of that as a, as a concept, but I will try to do that. Cool. Ruby, do you have any um, 